so hello. Um, hi, hi. Uh, as I was saying, that's a tough act to follow. Um, my name is Jay Singh Chaudhary, uh, and uh, I'm a core faculty member and a, and a director at uh, the, the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Uh, and the paper I'm, I'm going to read tonight is uh, I want to give like two little prefatory caveats before I like dive into it. Uh, one, it's or maybe three prefatory caveats. One, it's definitely a, like a working paper. It's something I'm trying to figure out right now. Two, it's like the second act in a three act thing. Um, you know, they'd said tonight. I think about um, you know uh, 1968 sort of political upheaval things like that. So I wanted to sort of take the part of this project and bring it to you that is really about sort of uh, political subjects and revolution and things of this nature. Uh, although it's a little oblique. Um, and three, this is part. Uh, so like as I said, this is this is like the second act. The second act of what? The second act of a of a large project that is a political theory for the Anthropocene. Um, so it's very much a political economy and political theory um, engagement with the question of sort of uh, carving out an ecological niche for human beings. Um, part one, which I am just going to stipulate, was a sort of grand gesture towards the necessity of thinking, especially on the left, which can feel uncomfortable sometimes, about uh, the state and the necessity of it. Um, and part three, which is where this sort of ends and gestures and brings leads off to, is actually thinking about what it would mean to carve this sustainable niche for human beings. So uh, without further ado, uh, this is Revolutionary Subjects, What is Mass Politics Today? Part one, stating the question. Uh, since the age of revolutions, the unit for political action, in particular democratic political action, oh, has been some form of the mass. Nations, classes, groupings, even quite simply crowds, have all held the peculiar position of the political or historical subject. The 20th century in particular came to be defined by particular distinct mass democratic subjects. Think of everything from communism to fascism to nationalist movements of all stripes to anti-colonial coalitions. All have been defined in some sense by what, on the one hand, Carl Schmitt famously noted as the friend-enemy distinction, the very definition of the political as agonism that which you can elevate to the level of state violence. Uh, politics is, you know, to turn around um, Clausewitz, merely war by other means. And on the other hand, what Elias Canetti simply called the crowd, a mysterious and universal phenomenon. But a funny thing happened on the way to the end of history. Where it once seemed almighty, inescapable, the political, although by no means power itself, has shrunk. In the bizarre inversion of the famous formulae of Thomas Hobbes, one can hardly say that the political is sovereign. There are only individuals and their families, declared Margaret Thatcher in her second most famous th say, statement. It barely even needs ideology critique. Uh, there are only individuals and their families. But she never said anything about those individuals, those families, being equal. As power is concentrated as private, whether as wealth or as domination, as if these things are anything but added, uh, that possibility for the state, which was once consolidated to break the power of feudal lords, and again transformed to break the power of the kings who displaced those lords, to once again be publicly dominant over the private sovereignties that dominate our 21st century life, the old company town resurrected as the new corporate city-state, the old aristocratic family resurrected as the new concentration of wealth by marriage, the old forms of empire, Roman, Ottoman, Mughal, Persian, which were delicate balances of power between not only crown and subject, but language and region, religion and judiciary, are reborn as transnational treaty alliances, not of states in reality, but of monopoly capital and its employees, regional power and global equilibrium, ideologies and their ever more diverse, flat expressions of the same story, there are only individuals and their families. Thatcher's provocation has turned into a stunning oracle. Unlike the moments and movements noted above, today we see the strange spectacle of the image of the mass movement. Indeed, sometimes even the performance of the mass movement itself. And here I'm not interested in the antagonist, the esthetized politics, which is not to say the policies of the dubious dominant units of our American political discourse, that is, Democrats and Republicans. The political in the democratic form has come to define the modern age. Uh, it's decimated. 
Here, democratic does not refer to a set of procedures or ideals of representation, but rather both mass in scale and mass in effect. The underappreciated critical theorist of law and economy, Franz Neumann, wrote towards the end of his life, in a democracy, political power is to be rationally employed, not only to keep private power down, but positively to shape a decent existence. This is often ignored. Thus, it is claimed that democracy is nothing more than a system of liberties which rest on natural law. Today, such theories are almost uniformly anti-democratic theories." End quote. I would add, today such theories are almost uniformly uh, and uh, I would add that today's such theories are precisely what is prescribed by self-appointed defenders of liberal democracy. Those who shake off mass movements of the right and left with the same gesture. Those who can only speak of the negative rule of law, but never of the purpose of democracy beyond guaranteeing those ever-reduced and redefined negative rights. Those who openly fear the entry of the mass into the organs of political power, movements, parties, governments, states. Those whose counsel to the dissatisfied, to the exhausted is better adaptation to the system of their exhaustion. Do little more than protect private power, protect wealth and domination in all their forms from the most powerful technology of the mass, the democratically sovereign state. But in the wake of centuries of mass movements, the question remains, what is mass politics today? Are any of the subjects of yesteryear, the liberal citizen, the class, the nation, the proverbial movement of movements, the party, allies, comrades, the new subject of politics, the new mass agent of fundamental, dare one even say, revolutionary transformation? To answer this, we must begin with a simpler question. What was the subject? Part two, what was the subject? The idea of the subject, that is the political subject, has a strange simultaneously dual meaning. The agent of political action, but also the object of political power, often perceived as alien, often quite accurately perceived as alien, a la subjects of the crown. There is another way to trace the meaning of the subject, though, through a more linguistic or metaphysical, metaphysical direction. It is not that these are questions that do not, fas that do not fascinate, um, that they do not point in directions for meaningful investigation or speculation. But I want to push to separate that which fascinates for scholastic reason from what seems to be a dead end for political thought. This is not to subordinate such investigations. If anything, the freedom, the pleasure of such thought and further thought is to move beyond the more trivial and boring measure of the political. So what I am sidestepping here is the relationship of the subject of politics, particularly of mass politics, with the subject in language, the idea of, say, the Kantian subject as a metaphysical necessity for knowledge itself, or the more anthropo anthropological notion of subjectivity uh, in more common language, the basic question of how any of us perceive and live in the world. One of my goals is to name the political and even while claiming its functional dominance, also limit it. Our inquiry is about common needs, not universal beings. Common feelings, not transcendental knowledge. Potential mass action, not internal individual life. In the liberal period, though, as exemplified from, say, Hobbes through Rousseau, the subject appears not as the obedient object of power, as expressed through the crown and ultimately God, but rather as the constituent power of the sovereign, Hobbes, or as itself the author of sovereign authority, Rousseau. But these positions, subject of the crown, citizen of the commonwealth, can be seen as ideal in the philosophical sense. Hobbes, the materialist, held strictly to a sense of added powers, but mostly the conceptions hover as abstractions over actual time, history and natural history, and space, matter. I.e., in philosophical jargon, they are transcendental concepts. One of the great innovations of 19th century European political thought, and one thinks in particular of Hegel and Marx here, is the question of why now? The question of history. It's not so much that Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and especially for this new philosophical universe, Kant, are wrong, but rather why did these, emerge, these ideas emerge when and how they did? Would they undergo further changes and transformations over time? For Hegel, what had been timeless in these previous accounts is turned into a process. Kant is not discovering timeless truths of human reason, but rather is a stage in the unfolding of reason itself, of Geist, it's a wonderful German word that means everything. That is to say, reason, spirit, mind. What I can improvise. Uh, this then, reason, a universal idea, becomes the subject of history, its chief agent, its driving force. 
With new formulations of the subject constructed this way, philosophers and political thinkers, actors and leaders began to move away from mechanical tales of subjects and citizens, and a new figure appears as industrialization and urbanization cluster people together, the mass. Mass politics. One could perhaps see this prefigured in Rousseau's general will or Hobbes' com composite sovereign. But even in these idealizations, the imagined communities, to use Ben Anderson's apt phrase, were small city-states or small country formations at best. But the unit of the mass in the 19th and 20th century takes on myriad new forms, the nation, the people, the class, the race, the crowd. Depending on how it is read and who is doing the reading, Hegel's Geist could be read as working itself out through any of these mediums. In in this logic of history, there would develop one pinnacle point beyond th uh, based through reason that stands in as the universal subject of history. In contrast to the subject of pol politics I began with, this would be totalizing and complete. Channeled, for example, through world historical individuals, Napoleon is the example par excellence, but truly you see it erupting in moments of great political transformation, like the French Revolution, which put people and nation on the world historical stage. And as perhaps subversively, as many have argued, the Haitian Revolution put race, understood more differently in the early 19th century, and freedom itself in the center of the story. We see in historical moments like these, according to Hegel, reason essentially taking form, actualizing itself through a mass event. The French Revolution for Hegel was the latest unfolding of the world spirit, of reason on the, on the historical stage. And here, philosophically, we find the idea of revolution as radical rupture, as breach with but also fulfillment of the past. Whereas earlier liberal thinkers like Locke had posited a right to rebellion and appeal to heaven, as he called it, uh, over the state, what we see in Hegel is not a return to a previous state of correct order, but rather a further sharpening of reason through the course of history. This vision of history as necessary progress, as rational, as always moving forward, driven by reason or progress, is as popular as it is wrong. Part three, what can, this, what can be the subject? Marx, in his famous phrasing, uh, in the famous phrasing, turned Hegel on his head. Marx noted that it's not ideas floating ethereally above the material world or even being channeled through it that drive historical and political transformation. Rather, we, human animals, have needs, wants, and desires, and we work, create systems, and otherwise carve out a part of nature to service these. This, in turn, creates what in Marx's terminology gets called a superstructure, the very ideas that Hegel saw running the show show are merely the reflection and the justification for the mode of production, the dominant way in which humans fulfill these needs. To make quick example, humans predominantly do this today through the market, whereas in pre-modern Europe, humans predominantly did this through the maintenance of a subsistence farming system whose surplus went to local powers for production, i.e., that is to say, we live in capitalism and previously Europeans, among others, lived in something we can roughly call feudalism. Instead of the stepladder to the end of history that Hegel imagined, Marx's analysis demonstrated an ever-simplifying prehistory from complex class structures, think lords, priests, burghers, guildsmen, journeymen, serfs, and so on, into simple ones, bourgeoisie, owners of capital, and proletariat, workers, in particular urban, industrial workers, with wealth ever more concentrated on the one side and numbers ever more concentrated on the other. It is beyond the, this, uh, the scope of this talk to go into the vast, and it is vast, literature that developed in many forms of Marxism. But suffice it to say that while much of Marx's descriptive, descriptive analysis st still bears fruit, the development of the proletariat as the subject of history several, suffered from several key dilemmas. One. Even though Marx was aware that there would be vestigial elements in his simplified class structure, and indeed people who were repeatedly, uh, were repeatedly and often thrown out of the system altogether, he thought that proletarians would come to constitute a vast majority of the population in simple demographic terms. Proletarians, for Marx, are not simply workers, but part of a concentrated industrial economy, experiencing the production of commodities, working in close quarters, with a great deal of shared understanding and easy communication. In no country on earth, and indeed globally speaking to this day, were proletarians of this kind ever the majority. 
Probably the high watermark came in a country like Sweden in the mid 20th century, but in urban industrial workers there still made up no more than 40% of the population. So no matter what form of politics a socialist was to take, a revolutionary or reformist, democratic or otherwise, it was going to involve a coalition unlike what Marx imagined. For example, the Bolsheviks. Industrial workers, yes, but also peasants and soldiers, and a not insignificant amount of especially bourgeois intellectuals. On the counterexample to revolutionary Bolshevism in the Marxist imaginary often lies social democracy, particularly in places like Sweden. But while the gains of Swedish social democracy are not to be ignored, indeed, they would be vast improvements for any emancipatory political movement. Uh, as Adam Jaworski and others have noted, once in power and committed to wringing concessions from capital, even a broad-based social democratic coalition is tied to the success of capital, and thus at, at its mercy when not surrounded by a larger militant social coalition. Sweden came very close to the social democratic vision of simply sailing across an invisible line between capitalism and socialism in the 1970s with what is called the Maidener Plan, which would have slowly over the course of some years transferred ownership of private stock from private hands into democratic control and moved profits from the pockets of the bourgeoisie into dividends for all. But capital, seeing this for what it was, the final transfer of power from its hands, balked and offered labor a deal that the average worker rationally could never refuse. Massive raises, massive increases in quality of life, uh, benefits, etc. Many contemporary social democrats with whom I greatly sympathize, and again whose policies would be, be beneficial if enacted, fail to see that this is a fundamentally rational decision for the labor portion of this coalition, if not ensconced within a much broader movement for liberation, far beyond the, conf the confines of concessions from capital. Finally, while Marx did in, did in fact foresee that labor coalitions could be rent by racial caste systems, he did not see that the right would develop its own political movements far beyond mere reaction. While later Marxist thinkers like Gramsci took seriously that the political terrain was real and had its own rules, Marx did not see the rise of different political movements of the right foresee them, like fascism in the 1920s and 30s and neoliberalism in the 1970s, that would split many workers uh, and beyond that pull liberal elites away from their once so revolutionary Republican commitments. For some time, and tonight's commemoration of 1968 is the perfect context to remember this, it was thought that not only was Marx off base about class formation, but also about immiseration and inequality. In the mid-1960s, most observers who looked to questions of inequality saw a world in which, indeed, in the liberal ideological ideal, a rising tide truly did raise all ships. In this era, thinkers like Herbert Marcuse and other figures of the New Left truly thought that a revolutionary subject could be cobbled together from the excluded, the repressed, the cast off. What we needed then was purely cultural transformation. We could have, as some like Chantal Mouffe and others still hew to, a movement of movements, agnostic about history and about reason, with only individual liberation as the goal. But this, as economic historians like Thomas Piketty and others have demonstrated, was a historical aberration, generated by the economic and political conditions engendered by the world wars. For some time now, and few in this audience, I imagine, will need to be reminded, immiseration has returned, and inequality, not only nationally, but internationally, indeed developing now on shifting international planes, approaches an all-time high. Indeed, Marx's observations, particularly about the question of surplus value, essentially the amount of value that is the true source of profit, that which can be squeezed between the price of labor and the price of exchange, have proven even more valuable than he thought. As the work of contemporary scholars focused on what is now called the Anthropocene point out, surplus value can be squeezed not only out of labor, but out of other social systems as well. Non-compensated reproductive labor, often gendered and racialized, and of course ecological systems, particularly energy, soil, the vast panoply of conditions that make up the niche that we humans live in. If there is a revolutionary project for the 21st century, it is a political project to carve, understand, and maintain this niche. If there is a crisis to Today, of state, of society, of ecology, of legitimacy. It is a crisis of exhaustion. 
But who is the political agent whose project this is? To return to where we started, to where we took off, the political is, is agonistic and the political is mass. The medium of political struggle is the state. To return to where we just landed, there is no automatic agent of history, no deus ex machina that comes preformed out of crisis to resolve the contradictions of our society. So here I will proffer a tentative proposition. It is the exhausted, across class, national, racial, and gendered boundaries, those who experience and recognize the fundamentally untenable nature of our social system, in nature and of nature in our social system, who constitute a political subject waiting to be conjured. It might seem strange to rest or even play with the idea of turning to those who are connected through the political affect of exhaustion, quite literally, the lack of energy. As a political base, but consider that in this past year in the United States alone, masses are moving again. Nearly 3% of the population took part in mass protest actions this past year. Many look at this and see an incoherent mass without form, idea, or focus. But this is mobilization in search of ideology. Our seemingly omnipotent global supply chains and local tyrannies show each other their cards of surplus value, of where they are exhausted, to those adjacent to them now on a daily basis. You, me, we may not know firsthand the end of a coral reef or the inside of a Shenzhen manufacturing plant or what truly happens when the political system is so exhausted that it collapses. But each of these places constitutes a location on the chain of exhaustion that can simultaneously locally and transnationally constitute a political subject, not in search of the end or beginning of history, but rather capable still of agitating for that sustainable niche, which is luxurious rest. This is not an obvious subject. For one thing, it does not share subjectivity, but it does share an experience, the unsustainability of our moment, and it can be placed within a comprehensive political program for democratic sovereignty over private power, for domination, not over nature, but over the sated, the satisfied, and the safe. It knows restraint only as the preservation of the minimum of negative freedom that constitutes the foundation of positive freedom. And its program is neither romantic longing for the past nor utopian techno-futurism, but rather, as Walter Benjamin once pushed us to look, a politics of the now, a geological composite of past and present crystallized into our moment, arrayed against the ever-proliferating forces which look to extract as much value as they can, as fast as they can, and increasingly, and this is truly beyond the work that Marx ever imagined, without necessarily a care for the reproduction of society itself. If there is a we that is to be constituted, a political subject worthy of our moment, it will be arrayed against these extractions of surplus value across our organic, social, economic, political systems. It is our task to help bring into focus the places where the exhaustion of one is the exhaustion of the next, where we see surplus values and their necessary elimination. This is a fundamentally political task. This consciousness must become political, such that all who are constituted through it are understood, regardless of personal disposition or intent as friend. Thank you.